We've now arrived at a whole host of new problems that you can be expected to solve, including predictive products type problems, synthetic problems, and mechanistic problems. And each one of those has a whole host of arrows and conventions and stuff like that. And so I'm going to teach you what the most common convention is here, but bear in mind that these are not firm rules. There are some flexibility and some people get sloppy and so on. These are the general conventions you should be aware of, but that doesn't mean that everyone's going to abide by them all the time, including myself. So for example, if you are dealing with a standard predict the product sort of situation, what you always have is starting materials on the left hand side of any arrow and a product or byproducts on the right hand side of any arrow. Traditionally, the starting material that will definitely be drawn is the main organic starting material that would be like the limiting reagent, the most important one. And typically you're going to draw out your product. You may not include on the left side of the arrow starting materials that are organic but not as important that you might use in excess, for example. And you may or may not include on the right side of the arrow any byproducts. The question is what you're trying to convey. But anyhow, you will have the main starting material on the left, you will have the main product on the right, everything else is a bit more variable. If you include more than one starting material on the left, then presumably they're all important. But if not, what you're going to tend to do is put those starting materials above the arrows. But not always. But if you see a compound above the arrow, that's what it's implied. It's another reagent in the reaction. It's a reactant. It belongs on the left-hand side. Underneath the arrow is where you typically have things like solvent and temperature and time and the concentration of any reagents. Basically any conditions that are useful in order to know how this reaction goes. With the exception that if you have reactants above the arrow, you may have equivalents of the reaction above the arrow as well. So hey, maybe you're only using one equivalent of this, maybe you're using 10 equivalents of this. That kind of information would show up above the arrow. Solvents are pretty variable because sometimes they're also reactants so they can be above or below. Again, this doesn't necessarily hold true, but those are sort of the general ideas. This is as contrasted to the synthesis sort of thing, where in general what you do in synthesis is work your way backward first. And so you're going to see this sort of hollowed out arrow with two barbs on it, and that's a retrosynthetic arrow. And what that means is this product came from or is derived from this starting material. So it's exactly the opposite is over here. So this is a forward direction arrow. This is a backward direction arrow. This product comes from this starting material. That's the idea there. So generally speaking, those are relatively straightforward, where things get quite a bit more complicated is when you have mechanisms and there what you're trying to convey are movement of electrons where we have a suite of arrows associated with those and whether this reaction is one way or an equilibrium state and again things get a little more complicated. If you have a curved arrow with two barbs on the head that is a two electron arrow and anytime you see an arrow with two barbs and it's curved you would tend to think electron flow. Straight arrows tend to be reaction arrows. If you have an arrow with a single barb what that is is a one electron arrow. So mostly in the course so far, we've done two electron movement. We haven't yet done a one electron movement, but that's possible. And that's something that we're going to do later. If you have a two headed arrow like this, what that usually implies is resonance. And in particular, if you have brackets, then what that is saying is these are the compounds that are all connected to each other by resonance. So formally, what you need to do is draw these kind of two headed arrows linking together any two of your resonance contributors, and then enclose all of the resonance contributors together in the brackets. And that way I know when I'm looking at it, that you mean everything that's within those brackets sums together to add up to the resonance hybrid. Equilibrium arrows, if you see they tend to have a long one direction, long the other direction, one barb on either side, what that tends to imply is that this is a balanced equilibrium. It doesn't necessarily mean that equilibrium is one, but it does mean that it's not biased too heavily in one direction or the other. So the idea is to go back and forth freely. Whereas if you have a long arrow in one direction and a short arrow in the other direction, what that tends to imply is that you have a highly biased equilibrium. And so in this case, what I'm saying is the equilibrium is biased heavily toward the product side, whereas if the arrow was longer coming back, obviously that would imply more toward the reactants. But notice that when you're drawing out these equilibrium arrows, what you're using is formally two different arrows, one with one barb each, and again that's saying, hey, this is equilibrium, as opposed to resonance, which are two-headed, two barbs on both sides. And then you then can highlight that this is a one-way reaction if what you have is a single arrow with a single head and barbs on it. And almost always this one-way reaction means it's going entirely to products. So basically this is biased but can come back. This cannot come back at all. This is a one-way ticket. Over here, what I've drawn is a classic scenario for a standard mechanistic arrow. And in fact, for two mechanistic arrows, this is a standard SN2 type mechanism wherein the nucleophile will come in and attack the carbon of the methyl group, which will cause the leaving group to leave. And in both cases, what you'll notice is that I'm using a single-headed but two-barbed curved arrow. Again, a two-electron arrow. Standard SN2 mechanism, standard electron flow arrows. At some point in this course, we're going to encounter as 
scenario where you actually use sodium metal, which has a single electron on it, and that single electron can participate in single electron reactions with materials that contain, say, double bonds or triple bonds. And so what can happen is you could take a arrow as follows, and it's best if I illustrate this with a triple bond, and this will cause the triple bond to fragment in such a way as to have the two single-headed arrows come together, and that will generate a lone pair, and in the meantime, this bond is breaking, but there are two electrons in the bond, so you're going to end up drawing a single barbed arrow going the other direction. So single-headed, single barb arrows mean one electron at a time, so the sodium is delivering one electron. The bond in the middle here of the triple bond is breaking, and one electron is going that way. Again, single-headed, single barbs, and uh, the other electron is going to end up on the other carbon. Two barbs, two electrons, one barb, single electron. Often, when you have a single electron process, bonds are going to be breaking in two directions at the same time, and so what that tends to mean is you're going to end up drawing three single-head, single-barb arrows at a time, often when you are doing this sort of radical chemistry. But these are the core mechanistic and arrow conventions that you should be aware of at this point.